And let's continue talking about uh, bedding plant production. I want to spend a little time talking about seed germination and some things on plug production. Um, what is a bedding plant? Bedding plant is a, is a big term. And uh, 1825 uh, is when we really started, when they really started the bedding plant industry, when we were just particularly talking about plants that were uh, planted outside. And it included the standards, ageratums, fuchsia, uh, begonias, etc. But uh, by about 1923, uh, bedding plants were probably becoming a major source of income for growers. The bedding plant industry is credited with starting in uh, Kalamazoo County, Michigan, which today is considered uh, the bedding plant capital of the world. And Kalamazoo, Mich Michigan is uh, it's down here in this um, southwest corner part of the state. Um, it was a uh, primarily a celery growing area, uh, very deep, rich soil, uh, muck soils, which is a form of peat. Um, and uh, with uh, urban renewal, the pedestrian mall in downtown Kalamazoo was the first pedestrian mall in the United States in 1959. Now, what was important about this area was the Kalamazoo Valley Plant Grower Cooperative. And it still exists today and is the large, largest bedding plant cooperative in the country. And what a cooperative is is a group of growers that work together. Now, over the next, uh, over the past 20, 30 years, uh, use of bedding plants has surged. And in fact, uh, this is a photograph from uh, Benari Seed Company uh, right outside their bedding plant trials, which you can see to the top left-hand part of the screen. And this uh, American flag is entirely bedding plants. So um, this is uh, pretty neat. What bedding plants do is, is it's an inexpensive splash of color to the landscape. Uh, it's, it's traditional at home. Uh, bedding plants work well in apartment complexes, uh, shopping malls, public buildings, city streets and parks. There is an organization called America in Bloom, which is promoting the planting of bedding plants in, uh, as far as a civic responsibility in many, many uh, regions of the country. Um, so bedding plants is a striking interest in many different ways. Now when you look at gardening, 80% of uh, households in the United States uh, spend some money in, on gardening, some form of gardening, and uh, a lot of that is on flower gardening. And um, flower gardening represents, uh, just bedding plants alone, represents 10% of all dollars spent on gardening. So it's 10% of all dollars, and so we're trying to compete for some of that fun, uh, money away from turf. Um, a lot of people are anti-turf. I happen to be not anti-turf, because where I have the biggest splash of turf in my yard is on the full southern exposure, and I like to cut my air conditioning bill just a little bit. Not a little bit, a lot. So um, old data. Um, and I choose this old data because it, in those days it included more states. But the, the same ratio continues today. Um, wholesale value of bedding and garden plants is it's more than, it's 49% of the total wholesale value of the greenhouse industry. And 42% of that, or most of it, is coming from California, Michigan, Texas, Ohio, and Florida. North Carolina bounces back up in, in and there every now and then, but uh, that's due to whether uh, primarily one grower. Now the highest value of uh, bedding plant industry is geraniums. Next comes impatiens. And the last year we have data for Colorado, which is again why I use 2001. Um, since 2001 they stopped collecting data for 32 states and only collect data for 15 states. So 10.5 million, 1.1 million dollars, 1.1 million, 1 million flats and one of the things that's interesting in Colorado, we get at this particular day about nine, on average, nine dollars and seventy-two cents per flat, versus a, a per flat value of seven dollars and seventy-nine cents on a national scale. Why does Colorado get more money for their flat? Because we're better. I'll take that. We are better. We grow better plants. Actually, uh, we grow some of the best pansy seedlings 
in the country, and we ship pansy seedlings all over the country, especially to the south, because they can't grow a good pansy seedling in the summertime. But it's primarily because it is quality is part of it, and also it's because we're more landlocked and we get a higher value. And in fact, um, our Colorado growers are competing against the Michigan growers because they're trying to get the flats, their flats into Colorado as well because they can get that 972 versus the 779 and can offset. Colorado is willing to spend a little bit more money. Is that retail per flat? No, that is wholesale value per flat. <laughs> That's wholesale value per flat. And um, I've showed you this graph before. If you can see that the yellow chart's going from 1980 to 1999, and it, it's even, uh, I showed you more up-to-date graph earlier in the semester. You just see that the bedding plant line is growing, growing, growing. Cut flowers is shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Potted flower material stays about the same. Potted foliage is staying about the same, but you can just see that, that the bedding plant industry is exploding. Most of the bedding plants are sold, of course, at garden centers, home improvement stores, and at discount chains, whereas the traditional florist shop typically doesn't sell bedding plants. They're selling the potted material, the cut flowers, and such as that. And the same thing with the supermarket. There are, you are starting to see more and more bedding plants at the supermarkets, but that's usually an afterthought. afterthought. So five states are generating 42% of the production. So what's driving the bedding plant industry is interstate tra shipping, uh, refrigerated storage uh, shipping, and ethyl block, which is an ethylene um, blocking compound. In fact, almost all uh, bedding plant growers that ship long dis distance will gas their trucks with ethyl block when they close the doors. That way they have a better uh, shelf life in the retail environment than they do in, um, uh, it just preserves the quality of that plant. So the, the majority, the, the, the biggest part of bedding plant production is, is seed handling and uh, germination of the seed. Then we have plug culture, then we have transplanting and autom automation, and then the general greenhouse production. So those are the four big parts of uh, bedding plant production that I'd like to talk about, um, probably setting off greenhouse production <coughs> for the next lecture. And seeds have been around for a lot of time, long time. You'll find the mention of uh, seed in lots of literature. This is one of my favorite quotes uh, from Thoreau. Though I do not believe that a plant will spring up where no seed has been, I have great faith in a seed. Convince me that you have a seed there and I'll be prepared to expect wonders. So in every piece of literature that goes back in the complete history of man, seed has been there somewhere. So what is germination? This is the textbook germination of, a uh, textbook definition of germination. It's a sequential process of including a resumption of preserved previously suppressed metabolic pathways and the differentiation of oxidative and synthetic pathways, ultimately bringing the embryonic axis into a state of active growth, which has been suspended during quiescence or dormancy. Morphologically, germination is the transformation of an embryo into an actively growing seedling. And in fact, it's a miracle. So, what I want you to think about is this seed is actually a miniature plant. Now, this is a big old bean seed. Um, and it's an arrested state of development. It's a mature ovule. Seeds have their own food supply, which is the endosperm. In that endosperm, we have carbohydrates, fats, proteins, depending on the kind of seed. And depending on what, what the, if it's carbohydrates, fats, or proteins, which is the highest concentration, has a lot of relevance of how you handle that seed. High fat seeds don't store well for a long time. Some of those high fat seeds we enjoy uh, because they're nuts, you know, pecans, um, walnuts. Um, some of them have lots of protein, peas and beans. So here we have what we call the true leaf. We have the radical and cotyledon. My arrows are pointing weird spots. The five stages 
of germination are, number one, the imbibition of water, that means taking up water, and after the plant, the seedling, the seed takes up water, the next thing that happens is an activation of enzymes. Now the activation of enzymes uh, is primarily one particular enzyme that I'm thinking about. You know what that enzyme is? Amylase. Amylase. Okay. And what amylase does is it starts to uh, activate and start to digest the starches or the fats, the proteins, and convert them into energy source that the plants can use, the seedling, the seed can use to start to grow. We have radical elongation, hypocotyl elongation, if it's a hypogenous, there's also epigenous germination, hypocotyl, and then we have true leaf development. So here we can see the, the hypocotyl is starting to reach out, and true leaf development, and as the plant starts to grow on. Gymnosperms, we know we have angiosperms and gymnosperms, and gymnosperms are a little bit unique in that they have a haploid megagametophyte and diploid embryo, and they don't have the same kind of cotyledon structure as does a monocot or a dicot. I just throw this picture in there to just show you that gymnosperms are a little different. Angiosperms are two cotyledons. Um, as we're talking about dicots, the endosperm is triploid, three sets of chromosomes. The endosperm is the food source, and the embryo itself is diploid. And angiosperm, angios means covered, and so it's a covered seed, whereas gymnosperm means naked or uncovered. So the dicot has two cotyledons, which the standard one that we look, we always think about is the bean. And the monocot uh, has one cotyledon, and uh, we think of that as corn. So that's the major difference. So let's continue on with a little bit more about what is germination. Now, told you before, the first stage is imbibition, which is that rehydration and the activization of enzymes. Now, uh, activization of metabolic processes includes RNA and protein synthesis stimulated by the alpha amylase activity. We get increased metabolism, in other words, it starts to respire. Okay? The next stage, now this all happens fairly quickly. We have the hydrolysis or the digestion of the food reserves by enzymes and this starts to change the cell structure. Uh, we take advantage of this in what's called the malting process as well because grains that are used in malting are typically not very easily digestible and so we stimulate this process called in, in barley and wheats where we malt it and we get higher sugar levels. It's not just for beer, it's also for malt meal. Um, I enjoy a malted, milk ball, malted milkshake just as much as I do anything else. So, we get the changes in the cell structure, and at this point, we start to see the induction of cell division and cell coat. Now, sometimes this rupture of seed coat happens during imbibition, but it's usually not until we get changes in the ultra structure we start to see growth. So the seed coat ruptures, and then we typically see the emergence of the seedling, of the rad emergence of the radical, and we usually see that first. We call that, in the industry, cracking. And when you see seed cracking, you see the radical emerges. Germination has already happened a long time ago. But this is the first visual evidence of germination. Post-germination, then we have root growth starts to happen, the shoot axis starts to expand, transport of materials from the food storage or the cotyledons to the growing axes and then we start to see senescence of those food storage tissues. Hopefully by then we have true leaves starting to form and photosynthesis is starting to take over. So this is a cascading process. So we have this little guy with 
putting out his little root radical with root hairs. Rest, we have mitochondria starting to re, uh, reconstitute as it starts to imbibe water. You have the soluble sugars are starting to form and respiration starts. It starts out initially strictly anaerobic, but it quickly needs oxy oxygen, which is important to remember in seed germination. Now this is a cascading process. We have ATP forming, activation of enzymes, polysomes take into effect, and protein synthesis starts to happen, and that's within half an hour. This is all happening pretty quick. Enzymes, proteins, DNA synthesis, 45 hours, then we start to see mitosis. This is a standard uh, cascading sequence that happens during a bean germination. So how do we control this process? It's controlled by gibberellins and abscisic acid. It's a balance. Gibberellins stimulate it typically. Abscisic acid uh, holds germination back. In fact, when you look at seed, seed that is dormant, quite often it's got high concentration of abscisic acid. Uh, some perennial plant propagators that are starting to work with wildflowers, species, and stuff like that, they have to use a cocktail of hormones oftentimes to get some unknown species to germinate if there's no standard practice. Now, gibberellins and abscisic acid actually work directly and impact genes. And they, they impact enzyme synthesis and that's controlled by DNA or RNA. And of course, they're all uh, if impacted by tem light, temperature, and humidity. So when a seed starts to germinate, as the fresh mass it increases, it's going to take in water from the soil or from the atmosphere initially, and that's how the, ma the fresh mass increases. Um, once the plumule appears above the soil, we start to see uh, photosynthesis and and when we start to see photosynthesis at a rate faster than respiration, that's when, and it's this point only, when the dry mass starts to increase. So what do we have to have for seed germination? We have to have water, warmth, appropriate temperature, and most importantly, we have to have oxygen. So here's a squash seedling with the cotyledon leaves, and you can see the uh, roots starting to come on, I mean the growing tip. Here's a lettuce seedling, um, basil seedlings, and tomato seedlings. At home, I like to use the little K-cups for growing my plants. It actually works quite well. Um, but the old coffee in the K-cup doesn't work well. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like coffee, or they don't like the coffee that I like. So a little bit about seed. Now the typical bedding plant grower, they don't buy their seed in seed racks like this. They buy their seed in, in high end, but this is a pretty good um, series to show you talking about seed. Um, seed packages by, are governed by law and they have to have certain um, things on them, whether it's a retail packet or a commercial packet, whether it's an half an ounce, uh, a milligram of seed, or a 50 pound bag of corn seed that you're going to plant in the field. They're all governed by the same rules. And the seed pack has to have certain things on it. It has to have the cultivar variety and it uh, most packets are going to tell you if, the, it's a, if it's a hybrid. Almost everything that we do is usually a F1 hybrid, unless it's a um, um, heirloom variety. Um, and then, of course, we're going to identify most flowers if they're biannuals, biennials, or perennials. Uh, most of the annuals, annual bedding plants that we grow are perennials somewhere. Like, for instance, I have a picture of myself standing next to an impatience in Colombia an impatience plant about this high. And my host was laughing at me because I was trying to figure out what the plant was. And it was an impatience. But I'm used to impatience about this high in the garden, not five foot high shrub. 
So annuals, of course, grow, bloom, and die in one season. Biennials bloom the second year after planting. Usually they have to go through a vernalization process. And perennials are those that come year after year. The next thing is they have to have a date. You're supposed to um, ideally use only seed that's for that, that date and year, for that, you know, packaged for that year. Uh, I'm as bad as anybody else. I buy too much seed every year and we got a freezer full of seed that we store and it works quite well. But, uh, so you should always buy fresh seed and because uh, poor storage conditions is going to reduce the viability of your seed. Some growers have uh, millions of dollars of seed. If they're a large grower, they get in and they have a lot of seed in their storage. Okay, some uh, brokers will sell you the seed and you don't pay for it until you use it if they know that you've got good quality storage conditions. Some growers will actually um, only order seed on demand. For instance, they're not going to maintain a stockpile. They're going to order their seed directly from the vendor and get their seed shipments every week for their planting through uh, UPS or the post office. That usually works until somebody like UPS goes on strike. And you need to think about your vendors, you know, if they're going to go on strike. UPS is a, um, um, they have um, uh, unionized drivers, whereas uh, FedEx does not. Post office is government. It just depends on how you want to handle your seed. So that's kind of a risk that you're hoping that you're going to get your seed every week. But then again, you're not having to invest in high-end storage facilities. So unless you know the seed is stored under proper conditions, you should always buy fresh or maintain a fresh supply. Germination. It's supposed to give you the percent germination to expect. And of course, you're going to get your direct sow, um, less figure, and count on ideal conditions to get a higher germination rate. And they have seed testing facilities. In fact, uh, in Shepherdson, there's a seed testing laboratory that does agronomic seed testing. It's supposed to tell you how to culture it. Now, in commercial seed lots, you're not going to get this because they're going to assume that you know how to how to take care of it. And it's going to typically come with a, a brochure of how to handle that seed, not necessarily on the container. Now, probably the biggest revelation or the big, biggest revolution in the bedding plant industry in the last um, 30, 35 years is the introduction of, introduction of plug culture. And what plug culture is is where we take a single cell germinate a seedling in that single cell and it allows mechanization, it's optimum time, space, and labor. We get more vigorous plants and less time to produce a crop and oftentimes growers can have multiple crops. So plug culture has revolutionized this industry. I remember seeing the first plug tray uh, when I was in graduate school at Texas A&M and I was just amazed that we could grow plants in that little bitty cell the size of my fingernail. Now, if you're going to do plug culture, you have to have some sort of a sewing machine, spelled with an O, um, or a seeding machine. And they go from everything from the multi, uh, several hundred thousand dollar uh, Blackmore sewing machines all the way down to a uh, vacuum tray, vacuum plate, where you can just sew one tray at a time. This vacuum plate down here in the lower left-hand corner has been um, precision milled with an aluminum plate with uh, a uh, chamber on the back. And we just take a little shop vac, or uh, it doesn't even, a shop vac is almost too much because it'll pull the seed through the holes. Um, but just a little vacuum and, and then pop it over. And it works quite well. So even the smallest grower can have a sewing machine. Most of the sewing machines that are on the market today, the most pictures I'm going to show you are all manufactured by a company called Blackmore, and they're out of Michigan. Seedling trays, um, the size of the tray, 
course, the tray size is going to be pretty much standard. The shape of the cell um, is critical to some different uh, growers. They, from 128 to 800 cells per tray. We have round ones, square ones, hexagonal. There are different depths. Uh, the most important thing, though, is to make sure that it fits your mechanical transplanter. Small cells are easy to transplant into little packs and flats. Larger cells typically for pots. And except smaller shell cells, of course, are less expensive to ship because we can ship more plants per unit. Deeper cells, of course, hold more oxygen, have better root development. However, it can be too wet. And we have six inch, four inch, you know, on and on and on. How much water and how much oxygen. So actually, as we go down in this, in, in the, on this slide from 6 to two, 648, what actually is changing the most is we have increased water holding capacity and decreased oxygen. All right. To, for mechanical handling of uh, plug culture, um, you need to think about the seed that you're handling. Most seed that's been um, processed for, trans for mechanical handling has been modified in some, some shape or another. For instance, marigolds, they have a little fluff on the end of their seed for blowing through the air. Okay? So we have to take that little tail off. So they've been detailed. Uh, and they've been detailed, not detailed. So um, the coating, the mini seed has been coated with a coating to either protect the seed or maybe provide a little fungicide. Um, Smaller seeds, such as begonias and petunias, that are very, very tiny, the, mechaniz the mechanical devices to handle seed that's sub almost microscopic, they'll coat the seed just to increase the size so it can be handled by a machine. Then we have another category called refined seed. Now, refined seed is uh, where they have machinery that goes through and sorts the seed sorts it by uniform size. If all the seed is of uniform size, it's going to germinate at a uniform rate. Uniformity is crucial, especially when you're trying to program a crop. Uniform germination. Now also, they have uh, equipment that goes through and sorts the seed, has um, cameras on it that looks at it to see if there's any cracks in the seed coat. They want to avoid seed cracks. And this gives a more uniform, more vigorous, and more uniform germination in your, in your crop. And of course, then the seed companies charge you more money for the seed that's been refined, of course. But then again, you're having a higher germination rate, more vigorous plants, and it's usually worth the money. You want to store your seed, of course, uh, 32 to 4 degrees Fahrenheit. I like to call that beer temperature. For those of you who don't drink beer, that's good milk temperature. Uh, low relative humidity. Um, if you're going to use the potting, the potting soil for germination, we need a pH of 5.5 to 5.8 with very low nutrient charge. It usually works with everything. We want, it's very important that the potting medium be uniform. Water quality, we need to have low alkaline water, very low sodium. And a lot of times, uh, for large-scale growers, need to have germination facilities. Um, we call them germination rooms in now. Uh, the last time I really called it a crack chamber, I was uh, giving a presentation at the prison greenhouses, and they didn't like that term. Um, um, actually, the prison industries, they have a, quite a successful greenhouse program. Control temperature, of course, control humidity, and light if you need it. So for plug production, we, we divide our germination into five stages. Stage one is when we take the seed, put it in the germination room, and stage one is seedling emergence to emergence, seedling germination to emergence of the radical. And this is typically done in a germination chamber. We want rapid, fast, uniform radical emergence. Some, some seed, depending on the seed it's, uh, we're working with will be in the, in the germination chamber 24 hours, 12 hours, sometimes 
48, 72, maybe even a week. The optimum temperature, there's the ideally we need to have germination chambers, separate germination chambers at three different temperatures. Cold, 60 to 65 for some species, 72 to 75 for another group, and 78 to 82. Three germination temperatures for most growers is a little bit cost prohibitive. Even the largest scale growers only have two. One 63 to 68 and one for their begonias, in other words, a 74 to 78. So they, that's typically what you'll see is those chambers. Now, at this point, in stage one, we're not applying any fertility. The goal in the germination chamber is that the potting soil or the media that the seed is sown onto neither gains water nor loses water. Neither gains water nor loses water. So they'll often use some kind of a fog system just to maintain the humidity at a critical level so there's no liquid water forming in the tray. Stage two is that period from radical emergence to the formation of the true first true leaves. Now depending on erratic germination, which we don't want, we want to have uniform germination, stage one and two are typically overlapped. Uh, stay, conditions for stage one and two are identical, however, light is required for stage two, so when we t moving from stage one to stage two, we're often usually moving those trays out into a greenhouse environment. Stage two, you have to have light. So a lot of times, and most stage two germination facilities use HID light for at least 18 hours. Stage two, the goal is to grow roots. Okay. Uniform moisture is critical. Again, we don't want the soil to either gain or lose moisture. And at this point, we're going to start hitting them with a little bit of fertilizer, nitrate only. No ammoniacal nitrogen at this point. Stage three is the from first formation of first true leaves to the transplantable stage. So a typical grower is going to be moving their plants from stage two to stage three. They're going to go to a warmer greenhouse. This is the longest period. Stage one and stage two could be two, just a couple of days, where this is typically several days, maybe even a week or so. Stage three is complete when the leaves cover the soil. So at this point, we're going to start alternating wet and dry to start strengthening that plant, hardening that plant. We're going from a warm greenhouse to a cool greenhouse now. We may or may not be using supplemental light, and we're going to bump the fertilizer. Some growers, to keep that plug compact, will start applying some plant growth regulators just to keep them from stretching. And it's important to watch your stretch because it gets into problems with automated machines. Stage four is from where, that period where the, the foliage has covered the tray to when we transplant it. Most people that grow their own plugs don't have a stage four. Stage four is typically for those growers that ship plugs. Ship plugs to somebody else that's going to transplant them. Moisture level stage four, we're not going to use a lot of fertilizer because at this point, we're going to start trying to hold the plant and we even think, need to think about foliar diseases because we've got a lot of dense foliage. So some people will use a fungicide before they box and ship their plants. Stage five is a stage that we don't want. Stage five is holding. Stage five means that your industry is backed up. Typically what it means is what backs up an industry is a wet weekend when sales are low. If sales slump in the retail garden centers, everything backs up, all the way back up to the plug production. But you're thinking you're so far ahead in the plug production stage that if you've got plug trays starting to back up, then you need to start thinking about storage. And some growers absolutely will use refrigerated storage. Um, maybe they'll use uh, irrigation strategies, but oftentimes it's a holding period. So it's really a challenge to manage stage five. 
And when you're transplanting, we want to transplant these as quickly as possible, and the goal is rapid root growth into the potting soil. So high quality potting soil now ger is different than germination media. The germination media is pretty fine textured, and the transplant medium should be moist, not wet, at transplant, and bottom heat is critical uh, for this, and we don't want to fertilize our plants until the roots hit the side of the container. That's a pretty much a rule of thumb. There's no point in putting fertilizer in the soil until the roots hit the side of the container. Okay. All right. For the rest of this time, I'm going to show you a video that I quickly put together this morning, just a gathering of some automated systems, and we'll see how it works. Somebody want to hit the lights?
showing uh, part of the community. Yeah, so she's double sewing it so you can actually see two pieces stuck together to drop two pieces in the seat cell right now. And then she goes, take a look at it, and then come on to the